you've touched on something that's really unique and that it's decision fatigue, right? So if your employees, your partner or whatever, your team is spending their time switching to be the person that needs to be the person in the room and not themselves, I mean, you're going to wear them out eventually and you're not going to get the best work out of them. Yeah, definitely. Why did we spend so much time and energy doing that on things that really at the end of the day don't matter? Didn't push the needle at all. Didn't push the needle. Welcome everyone to yet another fabulous episode of Get Carried Away. I am joined today with Wendy Ryan. She is the CEO of Kadabra. Um, the within the last 25 years, she has a combined experience in human resources, organizational development, nonprofit leadership, and executive coaching. Somehow she found time to write a book. She's also partnered with hundreds of individuals, organizations throughout the U.S., helping frontline through C-suite leaders, board members to achieve success as individuals, but also as a team. Today, she has joined me, and we are going to be talking about four ways your leadership needs to evolve. We're also going to talk about her book, Learn, Lead, Lift, How to Think and Act and Inspire Your Way to Greatness. Wow. Oh, and... Sometime she spent an entire year in Madrid, Spain, which is one of my favorite cities. And we're going to talk about that too, Wendy. Welcome, Wendy. Hi, Carrie. It's so great to be here. I'm glad to have you. Before we begin, I want to hear about Madrid. Why, when and where did that come about? Was it work? Was it fun? You just decided to leave and go to Madrid for a year? I don't blame you. <laughs> I was a student. I was a college student at the time. And a lot of universities offer education abroad programs. And so my university did, yay, UC Davis. And so I jumped on that opportunity and went, and it was an incredibly formative, it was very fun, but also very like character forming for me. So, so glad I did it. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, I went to Madrid a couple of years ago to visit a friend and we went to a city outside called Toledo. Did you mm -hmm. ever get so beautiful? It is. So I love really quick. You feel like Toledo it's gone like you've time. gone back in yeah. time and it has mm -hmm. a mosque, a Catholic church and a synagogue all within about three blocks of each other. Cause there was a time in Madrid when we all lived harmoniously in Spain. Right. I'm, uh, it's so cool. If you, everybody, anybody's in Madrid, I want to say it was like an hour away. Can't remember. Um, please go to Toledo. It's a beautiful city, but let's get back um, really quick. When, if I were to go back in time and ask 10 year old Wendy, what she wanted to be when she grew up. Would she say the CEO of Kadabra, helping leaders make change? She wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think she would have any concept that one, women could be CEOs. And two, that leadership development was a thing or helping people change was a thing. So I don't think she had any real idea at the time what she wanted to do. What would she have said? Well, she was really into ballet. So ah. I think a dancer would have been the top of the list. And then maybe something to do with animals, like a vet or, you know, someone who had a hundred animals was taking care of them all. So, right. yeah, well, I think I was the same 10 year old. I wanted horses and I did tap. <laughs> yeah. Horses was at the top of the list. Definitely. Yeah. Very close to ballet. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's cool. And then, so tell me how about your journey that brought you to be the CEO of Cadabra. If you, I'm sure you obviously went to UC Davis. Um, what brought you to where you are today? So I, by the time I ended college, I finally said, I changed my major three times in college. So I was one of those kids who genuinely did not know what they wanted to do and then changed their mind a couple of times in college. And it was a lot cheaper than to go to college. So you know, it wasn't a big deal that it probably took me an extra year because of that. But I finally majored in psychology and Spanish um, and decided, okay, I'm going to go be a therapist because I realized that I really liked helping people. My mom was a nurse and I think I got that helper healing spirit from her. And my dad was a public company CEO. So I also had some interest in business, but I, I was trying to reconcile the two at the time. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll go be a therapist. But you know what? 
how much life experience do I really have as a 21 year old? So I think wisely, I decided that before I signed up for a PhD program and went the therapist route, it might be a good idea to have some more real world work experience. So I decided, ooh, HR, that's a lot like business and helping people. So that's the direction I should go. And I graduated into uh, a terrible recession. It was impossible to find a job. Um, so it took a minute, but I finally found a job as a recruiter and man, did I learn a lot in, yeah. in a year doing that. Wow. Now, um, in recruiting the, were you placing people with businesses like temps? Gotcha. Yes, it was a temp recruiting agency for light industrial workers. And so, uh, and this was back in the day where, you know, we had a mainframe, we had terminals and resumes were flying back and forth over the fax machine and you were on the phone and it was like going to the battlefield every morning of like, are we going to be able to get enough workers in the right place by 8 a.m.? Oh, it was intense. Yeah. It was real intense. Wow. That's, ooh, that sounds like a lot of hustle. <laughs> oh, and how long were you in that before? What led you to found Cadabra? So, it, you know, many years later, I, I went through a fairly typical journey in HR and that I ended up doing a lot of different things, kind of what we call a generalist, an HR generalist. And then I thought, you know, it'd be really fun to do this for a bunch of different companies. So I um, worked for an HR outsourcing firm for a while, really liked that and decided, you know, what I really enjoy most is working with leaders. So how about um, if I do that? And so went out, started consulting and had a great mentor. Um, she taught me kind of the ins and outs. She also um, did that while throwing me into the deep end of the pool. So like a lot of people who get into coaching, facilitation, development work, I, I don't know that I had everything I probably needed, but I was able to cobble enough together through life experience and education and I don't know, creative thinking somehow that I think I still added value in the early years, but I really benefited from going back to grad school. I did get a master's in HR and OD. Um, and that was so helpful because I was doing things, but I didn't even know what they were really called or why they were the right things to do. And so going back for that master's gave me a that formal framework and vocabulary to be like, oh, that's what that's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I, so definitely recommend education is important. It's not everything, but it certainly adds to, to our toolkit in important ways. Especially with, you know, I also, I completely agree. My background's in education. So um, I think we should always be learning. We're never done, but it, it kind of increases your executive function, right? You're able to perform at a higher level and, and you have more critical thinking opportunities when you are put in like-minded groups of individuals who just problem solve differently. Um, so I think that's one of the best things you can get out of being in groups and education. So I think that's incredible. Um, and then as you were kind of going through the HR, you got your master's, how soon after that where you're like, I can, I can do this on my own. I can build this. You probably saw a gap or a need someplace. What was that? Well, I think like a lot of women in particular, I found myself shortly after I got my master's degree, um, needing to make a tough choice around, do I um, do caregiving full-time because our family's kind of overwhelmed right now? Or do I try to stay in and stay in consulting? And I ultimately decided the best path for me was to take some time out. So I thought of it as a sabbatical. I thought, okay, I'm going to take, you know, two, three years. That turned into seven years, um, which was longer than I wanted. But life kept kind of serving our family with a series of, of challenging things. People died, um, a lot of, lot of those, those kind of challenges. So I finally, um, after about seven years, everyone kept saying, well, you, you work, right? Like you, everyone kept assuming I had a professional job and I was doing a lot of volunteering. So I was like, okay, I need to go back. And I went back and I worked for the same consulting firm I had been with prior. So that was a real gift. About three years into that, I started to feel like 
I wanted to experiment. I wanted to play. I wanted to try new things. I felt like I had learned a lot um, it, just through experience as a, as a person. And I wanted to integrate that more. And the consulting firm I was with was not at a point where they were really interested in innovating. And they kind of had it dialed in like, this is how we do stuff. This is what we do. And not a lot of incentive to take a, a risk on something new. Mm. So I decided, you know, what the heck? I'm going to, I'd rather just risk my own name and my own brand. And I'm going to go out and see what happens. And so 2014 was the year. And since then, every year has really been me sitting down and saying, what wants to emerge now? Um, that's the question I always ask. So yes, I make a plan. Yes, we have strategies and goals, but that's really the bigger question that I think I'm trying to, to first me and now we are trying to live into each year. Yeah, it's a great question to revisit every year. You know, what do I want to grow? What do I want to emerge? Where do I want to, you know, go to, um, right. grow to even? It's, it's a, I think something with entrepreneurs, we have to continually ask ourselves, you know, especially in the reflection of the needs of our ideal clients. Um, so, you, and I love that you tapped into the fact that you you knew you wanted to work, but you also knew you needed to be a caregiver. It is a hard choice that women have, um, and some men. Don't get me wrong, um, but it is it you grapple with it, right? Because you've just done all of this education and you're ready to go, and then you're like, okay, but this needs my attention right now too. So. Bravo to you for, for making that transition um, into entrepreneurship. And during that, is that when you kind of saw the idea behind the book? When did the book kind of emerge from this? Really, uh, as it as 2018 hit, so about four years into uh, have, running Cadabra, I was approaching 50, you know, which is kind of a big birthday. And I started thinking about, well, what, what do I have to show for this aside from, you know, many, many great things, but really I've been in the field long enough. Um, wh what am I now contributing? You know, do I have a point of view that can actually help people beyond just what I'm doing day to day? And I'd always been a writer. I've always been a, a good writer mm -hmm. and I had never felt like it was the right time to write a book or that I was really clear what I wanted to write about. So I think turning 50, feeling like I finally had a pretty clear point of view on leadership. And I also still had a lot of curiosity about it. And I wanted to take my point of view and my curiosity, put them together, and then create something really practical and useful. So my vision for the book was, if you're a leader or someone who's aspiring to be and you have a single question, like how do I hold people accountable? Or um, is it really important you know, for me to do a strategic plan each year? Or you know, what is emotional intelligence all about? That I could literally just go to a really practical resource, go to a single chapter, read it, read it quickly, and then have a set of, here's what you can do about it, you have key concepts, what you can do about it. So very quickly, I can integrate something useful. To me, th those are the kind of books that I like, especially if they're professionally oriented. Yeah. And I really wanted to create that. And I am so, so proud of the fact that I think, I think we got there. You absolutely did. Um, I love the book. Thank you. And particularly the organization of it, because, uh, you know, um, I'm an Aquarius. So I get distracted by shiny things and I'm just like, yeah, that's good enough. I'll, and so I'll start a book and be like, I get it. But this one, I was like, oh, <laughs> there were all these. I also thought it was really thought provoking for me. And I, in my journey right now with building bra, it was like that again, it's serendipitous that I met you at this moment. Um, so I loved it. And we're going to put it in the show notes so everybody can um, get a copy because they need to have it. Um, but it's a great way to lead into your topic, which is four ways you're, leadership needs to evolve because I'm sure in your experience of, and I'm sure you have some great stories of working with some leaders that you're probably <laughs> profoundly wondering how the hell did you become a leader? <laughs> Tell us how leadership or leaders need to evolve, especially in our current climate um, of getting out of a pandemic. I'm sure that, you know, in and of itself has changed leadership. For sure. I think 
you know, one thing that really struck me as I was writing the book, and I think I, I talk a lot about now when I talk about the future of leadership or how it needs to evolve is the fact that so much of what companies still are operating with today, and this is whether you're a teeny tiny boutique firm or you're a Fortune 500 company, but so many of us are using models that are that were developed by white cis heterosexual men love mm -hmm. love those men however there's a certain point of view that comes with that and perhaps some things that get missed when your life experience is what it is and you're not necessarily including other perspectives in that um, so that's one thing and then a lot of those models are 20 30 years old yeah and we integrated them at a time when work was work and life was life and never the two shall meet. So when I was first uh, becoming an HR professional, I remember very clearly being told, you know, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. This is business and all that stuff has to be left at the door. Mm. And I look at that now, especially coming out of the pandemic. And I think, how is that even possible? Yeah. And why are we asking people to leave like half of themselves at home when they come in the door? And there's a difference between saying all of you is welcome here and, um, and, and saying, you know, just come and be, you know, behave however you want. That's not what we're saying. There's still our standards, there's still expectations, there's still targets we need to hit. But to be able to welcome more of a person into a space just releases so much more energy for them to move whatever it is forward that you need them to move. So I think one of the keys for evolving leadership is understanding that it's we have to be focused on creating spaces where people feel like they can bring most, if not all of themselves there, and they don't have to spend energy doing what we call code switching, which is Mm, I've got to, if I'm a black woman, do I have to straighten my hair, right? Mm -hmm. To, to fit in, or I have to dress a certain way, or I have to hide all my tattoos or whatever it is. Um, there are many, many ways that, that we ask people to do that still. And we're losing so much creative energy mm -hmm. um, and brain power in the process because they're having to spend time worrying about that, conforming to that versus creating something new and fabulous for the company. Yeah. Just yeah. worrying about getting ready, you know? Right. I think that also came from, because, you know, the system that we were kind of indoctrinated in was developed by white men. And so yes. they already had everything in common. They already, they didn't, That's right. they already had the wife at home with the kids and the 2.5 house and in the suburbs and everything. And the mistress on the side, I'm assuming allegedly, but so that's why when the rules were created, they're like, oh yeah, you feel the same way. And instead the probably the glaring things that they made people not talk about was religion and politics where right. they didn't have to worry about, you know, straightening your hair, for example. And I've see that all the time in, in big CEO companies asking black women to take their braids out. Um, right. things, and it's really shocking to me. And it just reminds me, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. That's right. This is why I came into this. That's right. Um, that's really incredible. And I think you, you've touched on something that's really unique and that it's decision fatigue, right? So if your employees, your partner or whatever, your team is spending their time switching to be the person that needs to be the person in the room and not themselves, I mean, you're going to wear them out eventually and you're not going to get the best work out of them because of that. Have you witnessed that? Have you seen that in your experiences working with certain companies, big ones or small ones? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know, when I think back now to so much coaching that I've done around executive presence, for example, yeah. particularly with women, and I think about how much of that work was really about, let's help them learn how to show up more as men, you know, and we, and we saw this with Elizabeth Holmes and the, mm. the Theranos story is probably the one that's most familiar to people where sure. she literally changed the, the timber of her voice, you know, adopted a deeper voice because she was coached that that was going to help her be successful. 
Why? Because it made her more male presenting. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think about that. I think about the ways that, how did I contribute to that as a coach, right? And so many ways that we tell people, you know, whether it's you've got to use certain hand gestures, you've got to stand a certain way, you know, we've done that. And I think in most cases with very good intentions, but why did we spend so much time and energy doing that on things that really at the end of the day, don't matter. Didn't push the needle at all. Didn't push the needle. So when, when I talk about evolving leadership at, and I and I talk about the learn, lead, lift framework, I think the four things we emphasize are that leadership has to be inclusive. So what we've been talking about, I think all falls under that umbrella, which is widening our tolerance for what's acceptable in the workplace when it comes to how people present themselves and um, what they're doing in their personal life. Again, not lowering standards, not saying any, everybody just come and show up as you are. We, we still have boundaries, but let's not ask people to do this silly, busy work we've been asking them to do. Right, conforming. This, this, yeah, and the second pillar is, and I think it's related to that, is it's got it, leadership today and going forward, it has to be equity-minded meaning that we we have to think about the fact and recognize that not everybody has the same needs. Not everybody starts at the same starting line in life. Not everyone has access to the same opportunities. And so sometimes with what is actually not too much effort or expense, if we just come with as leaders with the attitude with our team and just say, what do you need to be successful? We might be surprised at how sometimes very small adjustments you know, somebody needs to leave an hour early, right, on Fridays to pick up their kid mm-hmm. because they're a single mom. Somebody, um, you know, is caring for elderly parents at home and maybe they have to take their mom to the doctor Wednesdays at noon. Nursing. Those are just two, two thoughts, <laughs> right? Yeah. Again, the caregiving dance, right? Yeah. Um, realizing that just because someone's doing that doesn't mean they're less committed. They're, they should not be the person you pass up to promote or make that a criteria so equity-minded. I think the the third pillar that we talk about is authenticity. And this is, as a leader, it's not just about creating a space for other people to show up as they are. It's about you being willing to be vulnerable about what are you working to get better at? Yeah. Which is so different than how I think leaders have been used to operating. We're supposed to be the expert. We're supposed to be um, the person who always knows what to do. And I think the pandemic was the first time that a lot of leaders, and I think this was good for all of us, said, I have no idea what to do because we haven't had a pandemic in a hundred years. So how does anyone know what to do here? You know? So true. I think it was very humbling. Um, uh, for all, all of us, you know, I know when it first hit, I was like, nobody's going to need community, forget it. And then I was so <laughs> wrong. And I just kind of said, wait a minute, <laughs> I think we need yeah. community now more than ever, but I would have never, I also think, you know, where we were in, you know, February, 2020 to where we are today, the growth for some brands has been exponential had it not been for the pandemic, you know, I've, and in a great way too, not just an opportunist way, but in a great way. Um, yeah, I think it's, you've touched on such great things, equity, especially accessibility, all of that. And when you're work, tell me about the brands or the individuals you work with. I know you work with some big, huge companies. Um, I was looking on your LinkedIn, um, but, um, <laughs> if we bring it down to like the entrepreneurial level where they have maybe less than 10 employees, what, what's, how does Cadabra work with something smaller like that? Is it? Is it an e-course? Is it still a one-on-one coach? What does that look like? Yeah. Well, I would be remiss in saying that the fourth pillar before we forget oh, is, forgot. Tra- yes. is trauma-informed. Um, so I think the other thing that uh, is important for leaders to understand is we've, we've got to know something about trauma. So whether somebody's trauma is coming because their house got destroyed in a hurricane or they lost a loved one in COVID or it's older trauma from childhood, that does, people do bring that with them to work, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And so we can get um, 
so much more productivity and engagement from people if we just educate ourselves a little bit about that and just make it a, a safe space again to acknowledge that things happen outside of work that affect us at work. And I, as a leader, can always ask, what is it you need or how can I support you right now? I can acknowledge, wow, can see this as a tough time. Is there anything I can do that would make it easier? We don't have to be their therapist. We don't have to solve their problem, but just being present and not ignoring yeah. when people are in pain is so important. And I, I have to give a shout out to Brene Brown for helping to teach us not to look away from pain. I think she, she's been such a flag bearer for that message. And I think it's critically important. So to your question on entrepreneurs and, and how Cadabra works with them or can help. So part of our um, mission is really to enable the future of leadership. I mean, that's, that's what we're all about. And it consistent with the idea of how do we make things accessible? How do we support an equity-minded approach and all of that? Because that's the impact we want to have also as a company. Um, we're building a platform where whether you have $50 to invest or you have $50,000 to invest, you can find something on uh, through our website that will help you get information and support for what you need. So everything from purchasing the book for 10 or $15 to um, purchasing a tool called your Learn, Learn Lead Lift Story for $50, where you takes you through a process of understanding who you are as a leader and why you want to be a leader, to a card deck, to one-on-one -on -one coaching or facilitation or assessment. So really, I, I think there's something for everyone provided you are also committed to this idea of leadership being inclusive, equity-minded, authentic, and trauma-informed. Um, not everybody's ready for that, mm -hmm. and that's okay too. Yeah, I think that's, so there's clearly, you have to have an alignment there and maybe a little bit of in, uh, intake situation happens, you know, interviewing before you decide to, okay, we can, we can work together. Um, right. And I think that's a good, you know, I don't want to say like first step or barrier, but it's a good way to kind of weed out the people that aren't quite ready. Um, and then neither of you are wasting each other's time with that. Um, where do you see the future of Cadabra? Because I think what you're doing First off, I've never heard of a, anyone who does what you're doing at such a high performing level and at a, such an accessible level. You can buy the book or you can get the $50,000 or whatever coaching program and we'll stay with you and your company for their entire existence. Um, so right. I think that's incredible. And I think it's a great model for <laughs> other coaches um, because, you know, when you hear the word coach, you get that, that kind of like, hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to get upselled into the the Tony Robbins model of like, oh, now I got to pay for the seventy thousand dollar program and and everything. But here we have a well educated individual with a master's degree and who knows what they're doing. So I like that. I like all of that. Do you do you find what what's your joy in your work? What's your, like you're like ah, I love this. This is what gets me to want to show up every day. What what is that yeah. for you? It, it's really you know, we call it leading the learn, lead, lift way. So it's this idea that the the things we talk about in the book, the learn, lead, lift framework, the kind of tools and resources on our site or the, or the work we do through coaching or facilitation, that it ultimately it's, it's, we're helping each other in community lead the learn, lead, lift way. And, and when we do that, I think everybody really wins. So uh, obviously there, I think there's an opportunity for, for that idea to catch on. You know, I would love to think that it's a, a really virtuous movement of a sorts that people gravitate toward. Um, for me, it's not about, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to make the most money ever as a coach. It's really about, I, I want to impact the future of leadership and I want us to to do that together. And just the same way I approach the book, which is I have a point of view, I have some, some really clear values around that. But when I wrote the book, I went out and I did, you know, over 40 interviews with people that um, a lot of whom I had not known or met. And I was really deliberate in 
sitting down with people from all walks of life, all different sectors, all different kinds of businesses and organizations, because it's not just what do I think, it's what do we think. When you put a bunch of brains together and a bunch of different experiences together, how do we make sure that whatever kind of model or framework or philosophy we're following around leadership is like collective, it, it represents collective wisdom. It's mm-hmm. not just one person's opinion of what is great leadership. Ah, oh, I love that. Um, those are great paydays when you see what your students are, have, have now implemented and you're like, oh, see, there it is. And it, and it of course pays back in dividends, right? It's, it's going to work. Um, if you have employees and you just push them to the highest level and say, okay, here's your support, they'll fly. Um, and in your journey, what has been kind of something that you've experienced that was disappointing or you're, you weren't anticipating, um, what, or any kind of, you know, like speed bumps you kind of had to overcome in this or aha moments. What's something that you're kind of like, Oh, I didn't anticipate that. Uh, there have been so many. (laughs) And when I think about life and work, right. And, and all of it combined, I think it's, Anytime you are you are taking a risk to do something new, um, which I've taken, I take risks all the time. You know, we, you and I were just chatting before the interview about it, another project that you know is something I've never done before. I like to be on that learning curve. So Whitney Johnson talks about the S curve of learning, and and I think she's absolutely right that we're actually happiest if, as humans if we're on some sort of learning curve. But it also can be uncomfortable, especially if that curve is too steep. So I can think of a lot of times where I probably was um, at a, a real steep section of the curve or, you know, it was a little too steep for me at the time. Um, and and that was hard and humbling. And we, I think along the way, when I say we, you know, me and I think my team, if I think about just in Cadabra's life cycle, um, you know, we've, we've expanded and then we had to contract again and, yeah. and now we're expanding again. And the contraction part was really painful and it wasn't because we didn't have great people. It was because the, the business model, the context we were, we were trying to be successful in wasn't aligning and that was really hard. And so yeah. I think as, I think one of the things you learn as a, as an entrepreneur is that you're going to fail. You know, if you're going to take risks and do new things and jump on all these learning curves, like you are not going to succeed every time. But that doesn't mean you stop, you you keep going. So keep leaning into the grit, having a growth mindset and not beating yourself up about things forever is, is really important. I love that. So you've now given us all kinds of wisdom, not only ways to involve your leadership, but also how to get right back up <laughs> and build, build yep. yourself back up into that leader you want to be. Um, that's incredible. Any uh, advice you would give to anyone who's listening, who's kind of like on the right on that S curve, that's like, okay, I'm learning, I'm uncomfortable. What do I do? Should I keep going? <laughs> Should I pull back? What any advice you would give them? Well, I think, I think specific to leadership, if you, if part of your learning curve involves being a leader or becoming a different kind of leader. I think there's always two key questions that I, that I invite people to consider. One is why do I want to be a leader? So even if you were nominated or, you know, it's a family business and it just ended up with you, but why now at some level you're choosing that or assume you are, why? So what's in it for you? What is your why? Thank you, Simon Sinek for that. Yeah. Um, the second question is, who are you being as a leader? So it's, I've got my why clear. Who, who am I showing up as, as a leader to others? I think starting there, that tells us a lot about where we need to go next or how, what we need to be intentional about as we're working on that learning curve. When people are trying to go through that journey and they're not really aware of those two things, the why and the who, I think we miss a lot of learning along the way. And uh, then, you know, that doesn't serve us or the, or the people around us. Well, yeah, 
Agree. Agree. Wow. Wendy, you've given us a lot to think about. And if someone's driving right now and they have to go back to the show notes, how do they get in touch with you to learn more? Tell us where we can find you and keep the conversation Absolutely. going. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So that's a great place to, to follow me and um, to, to see lots of things we're posting about. And our website is a really rich um, I think it's a gold mine of of information and resources and and thought provoking, um, you know, journeys to go on. And so that is uh, we are cadabra dot com. Cadabra's with a K. Gotcha, gotcha. I love that. I was actually looking at you have a lot of great prompts in in on in your about page. You know, asking us, you know, how do you feel about inclusive and equity? And so I really like the DEI work you've done behind it. It's it's really 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 well done. Um, Bravo. But before we go, um, we have to get carried away other than Spain (laughs) going to getting carried away about Spain. Let's bring it back into what's tell me a couple things that you, you know, get absolutely carried away about, you know, during whether it was during the pandemic and you started baking or you really are into hiking or swimming with sharks. What, what's something that you get carried away about? (laughs) I wish, I wish it was that cool, my hobbies, but (laughs) I am wild about dogs. I only Ah. have one, but she is just, just my love. And I, I've always had a natural affinity for animals. I've often said, if I didn't go into this line of work, uh, other thoughts were vet or zookeeper. Um, It's still a fantasy I think I have and, and big trees. So I'm a very nerdy when it comes to it walk down the street and in, in my neighborhood, we have some gorgeous, big old oak trees. And I just will stand under them with my mouth open, like a total nerd, just going, <laughs> wow. Cause they're just majestic. And what I love about trees is that they remind me no matter how stressed I am, or, you know, I'm thinking about a, a mile a minute, million things I need to do. Trees just are like, they're just great reminders that just to stand still and be is good enough. We don't always have to like do, sometimes you just can be. And I I need that from time to time. It's really therapeutic. I love that. I also love the book, The Giving Tree, um, Mm. which is such a good story. I cry every time. Yeah, you reminded me (laughs) of it. And I know you live in the Bay Area, so you've had to have gone to the Redwoods in Northern California. I'm just in awe. I'm just in awe. I mean, they're just, yeah they have a presence and a soul. And if you are still with them, I think you can really sense that. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I, I, I feel humbled by trees when I see them and we have a lot here in Southern California that were imported, you know, that's how we have palm trees. They're not indigenous to this area. Um, but, um, when I go to Hawaii, just on a sidebar, if you just go outside and listen to the ocean and the wind go through the trees, it is, I think it's the Hawaiian magic that keeps everyone calm and everything slow, everything slow paced. It's, it's a reminder. I love, nobody's ever said trees. That was really, that was a really good answer. (laughs) Love that. Okay. And now the opposite is, um, things that, you know, people are obsessed about that get unbelievably carried away about. Um, but you can't wrap your head around it. Um, for example, I don't like camping. People love, I do like trees, but I want to visit them and go home. (laughs) I don't get it. Well, we are exactly the same in that, Carrie, which is why I know we could probably vacation together and have a good time because I, I want to be outside and then I want to go back to a wonderful shower and a gourmet meal and, and wonderful bed yes. and all those things. <laughs> but <laughs> with the but dogs, the, I'm with you. Yeah, with the dogs. Exactly. <laughs> Perfection right there. Um, but I, I think other things for me, professional wrestling. I just cannot get my head around. And it also extends to boxing. So I think anything for me where uh, like violence is entertainment, I have a really hard time with that. It doesn't bother me as much in the movies because I kind of know it's staged and Mm -hmm. even though it looks really real and that's amazing. Um, But I I have a harder time seeing it like on TV as a a so-called sport. So I don't love that. and then the other thing is kind of a really smaller pet peeve, but it's wearing pajama bottom flannels, pants to the grocery store. 
<laughs> when you're over the age of 18. I just feel like taking those people aside, because I've seen people do it who are 50, 60, you know, all kinds of ages. <laughs> and I just say to myself, just put on your jeans. How long does yeah. it take? Or your sweatpants even. Like maybe you wore your sweatpants to bed, but there's something about a, a flannel pajama right. bottom that just screams to me like you just couldn't be bothered to put on mm -hmm. pants. <laughs> and that bothers me. Why I don't know, <laughs> but it does. Put on the solid color pajama pants. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yoga pants, any other kind of pants. Yeah. Not the pajamas. You know, nobody's ever said that either. <laughs> I don't get on that same, you know, note, I don't get people who can't be bothered to put on shoes. Like just put on some flip-flops. Yeah. You don't need to be yeah. in socks or slippers buying right. groceries. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Uh, well, Wendy, thank you so much. We're going to have all your contact and a link to the book as well. Learn, Lead, Lift, How to Think, Act, and Inspire Your Way to Greatness. It's it's a really, I've enjoyed, I haven't finished it, but um, like I said, I, I start something and then I'm like, what? And then I get back to it, but I'm excited. After talking to you, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, so I'm, I'm excited to go back to it and, and open it back up again. Thank you so much for being my guest and getting carried away. Uh, this was so fun. And if you are watch, listening to this in the car, make sure you pull over first and click all the links to get in contact with Wendy and connect with her on LinkedIn. And then like, and subscribe this episode. If you're watching on YouTube or on iTunes or all the places podcasts are listened to. Thank you, Wendy. You were fantastic. And thanks for getting carried away. My pleasure, Carrie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.